Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we're a webinar, uh, a webcast, um, whatever you want to call us. Uh, we're online and we're live every Wednesday morning. Um, the show is free to anyone to watch both our live shows. Uh, which we do here at 10 a.m. on Wednesday mornings, and all of our recordings. We have the recordings of all of our previous shows. We post them up to YouTube and have the links from our Encompass Live website, so you can access them all from there um, if you want to. Uh, these uh, sessions are a mixture of things, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, basically anything library related we are um, happy to have on the show. Uh, we do a, we also, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations and we bring in a guest speaker sometimes. Um, and that is what we have this morning, um, as you can see from our, the first slide here. Um, on the line we have with us um, Kathy Liddell who's from North Lake Public Library District up in Illinois. Um, hello, Kathy. Hi. Good Hi. Morning. Good morning. And um, she's been doing some work um, recently with um, immigrants, non-native speakers, and helping them out with their uh, legal info needs. And so she's going to talk to us about what they've been doing up there in North Lake um, to help them out and give us some tips and things for what we can do in our libraries. So um, I'll go ahead and take it away, Kathy. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I first wanted to start out um, with a presentation telling you a little bit about myself and my job at Northlake, um, and then describing the community of Northlake, and then going into the three different local, um, legal programs that I did at our library. Um, one was the Deferred Action for Children ar Arrivals, um, and the Illinois Temporary Driver's License, and um, Citizenship. Um, so uh, before I became a librarian, I worked in uh, nonprofits, um, uh, nonprofit organizations for 10 years before returning to graduate school. And um, during that time, I worked extensively with Spanish speakers. Um, I worked in a family planning clinic. I worked with farm workers as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, I worked um, also with child development, home visiting. And then so when I decided to go back, um, I received a master's in library science and in Latin American studies. So I have two master's degrees from Indiana University. And um, I've been working at uh, North Lake Library for almost seven years. Oops, it's not clicking through. There we go. <laughs> um, so a little bit about our, our district. Uh, we're located west of, of downtown Chicago, about 17 miles. Um, our district includes Nor the city of North Lake, the village of Stone Park, and unincorporated Leiden Township, which when I came to this position, it's always strange to have unincorporated areas in a metropolitan area. Um, and um, our service population is probably like 26,000. And um, a third of our service population um, was uh, born in Mexico. And between 50 and 60 percent of our patrons speak Spanish at home. Um, so the legal programming um, kind of came about uh, for me. Uh, my job, I, I work mostly, I should probably say a little bit more about what I do. I'm the outreach librarian. Um, and I also manage the Spanish collection. Um, I'm also responsible for teaching um, computer classes, but also doing um, also different other types of programming. So I really saw it as a patron uh, concern about uh, legal, pro you know, the need for information about immigration issues. So um, and the laws in the state of Illinois were changing, um, as well as the ones nationwide. And even though we're very close to Chicago, we really don't have tons of nonprofits that deal with those uh, immigration and other social service issues. It's pretty much North Lake and then the city. Um, when we refer people to organizations for different needs, it's pretty much they have to go to the Chicago. So and then finally, um, I really got the idea, started thinking about it um, when there was a, a large um, uh, like event at Navy Pier, it was a DACA, so it's the Deferred Action for Child Arri Arrivals event in August of 2012, um, soon after the Obama administration announced, the, announced it, the, the 
deferred action. So I'm going to go to first talk a little bit about um, deferred action. So it was uh, announced by Janet uh, Napolitano, and it really helped um, people who um, stopped de the deportation of undocumented youth, people who were brought here um, as children. <clears throat> so it's basically to stop the deportation of young people. Um, and as many as you know, 24,000 in Illinois um, had applied, but there was still between 70 and 75,000 who still qualify. And this is probably 2012-2013 um, uh, uh, numbers. So basically, requirements were they they um, for DACA are to they have they need to have come to the U.S. before the age of 16, and that they were present in the U.S. Um, you know, on the date that um, the law was passed in June 15th of 2012, and that they were continuously resided in the U.S. for five years. Another requirement was that they were currently in school, um, they, you know, graduated from high school, were working on a GED, um, or were honorably discharged from the armed forces or the Coast Guard. <clears throat> So the requirements um, also included um, obviously not being uh, uh, convicted of a crime or that they were a threat to um, national or, or public security. And they weren't above the age of, of 30. Um, that also require, required a $475 applica application fee. Um, and this policy is temporary, um, and it needs to be renewed every two years. Um, so actually there is, I've noticed locally that they have um, DACA uh, renewal um, workshops that have been, I've noticed some in the city, so um, that's something that I'm definitely going to consider doing or possibly do on just another full-fledged uh, uh, DACA workshop at our library. Um, so the people I contacted were the National Immigration Justice Center. And they're basically, um, you know, legal services and advocacy for asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants. Um, and they typically don't come to libraries. They usually just go to law firms and, um, and have an event at a large law firm, and then they pair up people who are interested and they sign up online with their organization. So this was kind of um, something new for them, but I was persistent because <laughs> it's something that I really wanted to have um, available at the library. So I started in September <laughs> when I first contacted them and I didn't finalize the date until December 6th. And um, I emailed the woman frequently and I, you know, it took a, a bit of time to convince her because sometimes for nonprofit organizations in the city, um, 17 miles is kind of too far for them to go. So the workshop itself, um, uh, the National Immigration Center um, provided all the things necessary to apply. So that included um, the forms. Um, they also offered quite, they went question by question instruction on the forms. Um, there was a lot of questions, obviously, about um, eligibility. Um, you know, they also gave guidance on what kind of evidence they would have to present. Um, and then they would explain the, the next step in the process. Oops, oops, sorry, goofed. Um, participants um, were welcome to submit um, the applications themselves. Um, so technically, I mean, anyone could, I guess, fill out the application for DACA and submit it. Um, and, and then this organization would review, if they wanted to, it was optional, review their application for $100. Um, but that's not something that they were pushing at the, at the workshop. The workshop was free to everyone, that part you know, all the participants. It was just an option for them. And um, there's a lot, there's, I mean, I think uh, with legal issues, there's always a possibility of scams. Um, there's no lawyers in Chicago that were kind of capitalizing on um, the deferred action and charging anywhere from five hundred to five thousand dollars for their services for filling out the application. So, 
I was really grateful that we were able to uh, offer this service to our patrons for free. <clears throat> so I um, advertised this, um, in this workshop um, both on the NIJC and Northlake websites. So the organization that actually put on our, uh, the workshop, they advertise on, on their website. And then as well as, you know, Facebook, <coughs> excuse me, Facebook links to registration because um, um, NIJC were, were the people that actually had um, created the online registration because our library does not have that. I mean, at the time it didn't, we do now. Um, so we created links. Um, and, you know, I was talking with parents with school-aged children. Um, our local uh, junior college, I also contacted them, um, Triton College, and also excuse me, the local um, Catholic church that's just on the block from the library. So at the workshop, <clears throat> there was a certain amount of um, documentation of their presence in the U.S. that um, they needed to kind of be able to provide just to have it available and collected. Um, one, so the requirement was obviously their age um, and their identity and their presence in the U.S. Um, for five years and um, before they were 16 years of age. So um, <clears throat> obviously age and identity would be with uh, any kind of, you know, state ID that they would have. But um, so, but in terms of creating um, evidence for their presence in the U.S., it would be through school transcripts or report cards, immunization records, those types of things. So. Um, some of the benefits, obviously, of um, deferred action, it made people eligible, to, uh, excuse me, eligible to work, um, legally work in the U.S. Um, the time that they spent in, because it is a conditional resident status, um, would count towards residency requirements um, for naturalization. And they're able to partake in the same activities as a legal resident, um, except for they wouldn't qualify for things like a Pell Grant or they couldn't tra travel extensively outside the U.S. Okay. There's also some um, drawbacks to DACA. Um, the information that's gathered during that application um, could be used, um, you know, against some of the, of the applicants um, if for some reason it revealed that there was a fraud or criminal offense or a threat to um, national or public security. Um, there's a certain, I think, um, in general, um, with um, the popular, our, our, our patrons who are immigrants, uh, mistrust of the government. Um, and so the kind of the mistrust of DACA, um, if individuals or families um, were, you know, deported because of the information that the applicant supplied. Um, for their application. Um, there's also kind of the, the, the issue of employers, um, you know, providing evidence of, of someone's present in the U.S. and that being kind of a self-incriminating, um, uh, that they would self-incriminate themselves. So they would somehow be punished for having um, a worker that was undocumented. Okay, so the next um, <coughs> the next program that I that I had uh, was the uh, Illinois Temporary Drivers License um, program. Um, so the state of Illinois passed uh, a law allowing undocumented immigrants to obtain a temporary driver's license, um, and so this is kind of uh, Illinois was the tenth state to actually enact something like this. Um, you know, the other states include uh, New Mexico and Washington and Colorado, um, Maryland, um, as well as the wa Washington, D.C. So the state of Illinois has, um, since 2005, issued licenses for foreign students or long-term visitors. So it's something that's not really um, new to the state of Illinois. 
Okay, so this law was passed in January of 2013, and the state began accepting applications in November of 2013. So in the state of Illinois, uh, as many as a half a million people qualified for the temporary driver's license. So the temporary driver's license itself is very different from a permanent uh, license in terms of color, and it clearly states that it's not valid for identification. So um, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrants and Refugee Rights, uh, rights excuse me, um, was the organization that I worked with for this workshop. Um, they're um, based in Chicago, and so they, they are a really very large um, nonprofit organization that works with a lot of different campaigns. Um, they do Dream Relief, um, a new American citizenship program, uh, project, just to name a few. And they were the people that hosted the DACA event um, at Navy Pier in Chicago, um, where 13,000 people showed up to apply um, for deferred action. Not all of them obviously got through because it was an all-day event, um, but uh, they're one of the... Um, probably the largest nonprofit organization that deals with uh, refugees and immigrants. Okay, so I contacted um, Jesse Hoyt at ICIR. Um, so they did a one-hour uh, presentation um, on the requirements of the temporary driver's license. Um, so I did similar type of outreach uh, as I did for the DACA workshop. Um, out, I did outreach through um, Facebook, um, our website, um, flyers in the library. Um, if people, you know, if I felt comfortable enough, if people would ask, you know, reference questions, that's part, part of my job at, at the library, um, I would ask them if they, they knew of somebody or if they were interested in information on it. Um, and so there was no registration because it was more of a lecture style workshop. Um, DACA, it was important to um, uh, have people register so they knew how many materials that they were supposed to bring and if they have sufficient, uh, sufficient staff. But um, for this, anyone, you know, could come. It was just a matter of me advertising it. Okay. Um, so there's certain... Um, required documentation for the temporary driver's license, um, name and date of birth, you know, their current address, um, their written signature, and proof of one year of residence in Illinois. It could be a rental agreement, um, could be one example. Mm -hmm. So for the Illinois driver's, temporary driver's license, um, it was required that they pass all the vision and road and written tests. Um, also, they, it was necessary at the time that they w had their appointment to show proof of um, a car car insurance and to pay a fee. Uh, I'm sorry, pay a fee of thirty dollars for the license. And so you'll see in this slide um, to the left, um, there's a standard driver's license for Illinois. Um, and then to the right um, is the temporary driver's license that are issued to um, people who are, are undocumented. Um, you'll notice it says not valid for identification, and so the colors are different um, as well as showing that it's not valid for identification. Um, if for some reason um, someone was stopped, um, and they have a temporary driver's license in the state of Illinois, and they do not have car insurance, their license is immediately revoked. <clears throat> so um, some of the, the, the benefits of the, um, the temporary driver's licenses, um, people are, you know, um, are able to drive without constant fear of being pulled over. Um, we had someone, we had a journalist from the Pioneer Press, which is a local conglomerate uh, newspaper of suburban um, Chicagoland, uh, talk to people who had attended the workshop 
Um, and that was one kind of definite feedback that they got, you know, that he, he got was that they don't have to constantly be afraid of being pulled over. Um, and it, it saves um, law enforcement, um, you know, jail space and time of enforcement. Um, people are educated on the driving laws of Illinois. Um, we provide for our patrons uh, rules of the road in Spanish. And I think we also have it in Polish also, um, as well as English. Um, and the benefit is also, you know, the car insurance requirements. Um, in a perfect world, everyone has car insurance, but it is a requirement. So, um, you know, they may or may not have it, but their license are revo is revoked if they are stopped without car insurance. Do I have any questions? I, I'm, I'm just talking to myself in my office through this microphone. Yeah. No, no, Kathy, no, that's great. Um, no, um, it is, yeah, yeah, webinars can be a little awkward. No, we, actually, we do have a couple of questions, and one, actually, the slide you just went to, I think, okay, great. is uh, relevant. So I wanted to know if you knew why is the temporary license not valid for identification? Um, it's only for the purposes of driving, strictly for the purposes of driving, and that's, that's only driving. Um, and, and I think it, it's uh, an issue where I think it's, to me, I think it might be an immigration issue. It's that they don't want to feel like, I don't know, people who are undocumented are taking advantage, I don't know, taking advantage of the system and they're, they're trying to get driver's license and get things that they don't, I mean, that's my perception. Um, but I think that there's other ways that they can, um, at least, I know of, for people who are undocumented, they can get something that's called the matricula consular through the um, Mexican consulate in Chicago. And that's just generic ID for them. Okay. That's what people, yeah. So there's other ways to get um, something that is valid for identification, not the driver's license. Yes, correct. For those of us that's who are, have yeah. regular driver's license that can serve as our um, form of ID. Yes, uh -huh. and so, um, like for example, we if someone comes in, um, our library really um, strives to make everybody feel comfortable. So we don't ask. Um, we we use the matricula consular to issue um, library cards to people because you know I think people will use sometimes use their children's library card because they don't. They're afraid of, you know, we're considered a government entity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, that's something that we accept. Um, we accept um, the matricula consular for, to issue library cards to patrons. Okay. Another question was from Mill earlier. Um, these programs that you did, um, when were you doing these programs? Was this just last year or? Uh... It, started, um, it started two years ago. Um, so it was December 2012. So... Um, like the first program like, that you were talking about with the um, the first program before the life, yeah, the deferred action yeah. one, yeah, that one. These were all these were all all the programs you're talking about were started at about the same time. Um, not at the same time. The first one, um, DACA, was in December. It so it was kind of an opportune time because the law had just been chat. Uh, passed in June. Um, and then the temporary driver's license, that's something I started in January of this year. Okay. Um, and actually, I've done it, uh, I did it in January, and then I did it again this fall. I think it was October or September. And both times, um, the turnout was pretty high. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, high means 30 people. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so there was definitely uh, a good response from our community. Okay, great. Um, that's all the questions we had at the moment. If anyone does have any questions, I'll just remind you, you can use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Type in your questions. I am monitoring them here. Um, if you have a microphone and you want to use your microphone, just like Kathy and I are using ours to ask a question, just use the raise hand option on your, on your GoToWebinar interface and I can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Um, and that, yeah, that's all the questions we had at the moment, so um, go ahead and continue okay. on. Great. So, um, getting back to uh, the temporary driver's license, um, I, I think it, it, it's really been something that's been beneficial uh, for people who um, are, you know, are driving without a license and not really knowing uh, the rules of the road. So, 
Um, but there's also some drawbacks to having a temporary driver's license or the process of applying. Um, obviously, one of them is it's you can't it's not used as proof of identity. Um, so. I guess if someone asks me, you know, I have this temporary driver's license, and if I can't use it for um, a valid form of ID, and I would refer them to uh, the consulate in Chicago to get in the matricula consular, which is uh, a, Nash, a Mexican national identification. Um, there is a possibility of deportation, unfortunately. Um, you know, they they do a background check, obviously, into an individual, and so. Um, there is a possibility uh, of deportation, and I think within the last couple months, I've heard of one case. I think on um, in the news, I think uh, where someone was deported. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know how many per year people are deported, you know, related to applying for a license. Um, and the license itself isn't um, issued immediately, so. When you go to renew your license um, and they issue it immediately, I mean at least in Illinois they do, um, it, it's not issued immediately so that they do, you know, they have to do a background check, et cetera, and then, and then they, ish, then they um, mail it to, um, they mail it to the person. Um, so when it, you know, the proof of identity issue, you know, can't be used to board an airplane or even ent entering a federal building or getting a firearm um, permit, um, so. Um, there's been some administrative glitches uh, uh, with um, the temporary driver's license. The sheer volume of people was, you know, the response was, the system was really inundated. And um, the state of Illinois is only, was able to process uh, 100,000 applications yearly, and they got 500, you know, 500,000 <laughs> applicants. Um, so there's significant wait times for appointments. Um, there's been difficulties in, in uh, getting appointments by phone uh, because we've had patrons ask about that. There's also the ability to um, get an appointment online, but again, um, in the beginning, there was only, I think, six facilities that were actually issuing them, and now they've expanded it, I think, through most of the, the state of Illinois. So um, when ICIRR, the organization that we worked with for the temporary driver's license, had said that, you know, technically you could make an appointment in Springfield, which is, you know, the capital, um, if you lived in Chicagoland, just so you would get it issued. Um, so, I mean, it's been kind of a challenge for um, administratively. So um, the next program that I, that I did at our library um, was around citizenship. Um, and I worked with a federal organization, the United States Immigration and Customs Service, which is based in Chicago. Um, uh, the U USCIS and the Institute of museum and library services have uh, an ongoing partnership, I think, that developed probably a little over a year ago. And so the USCIS has awarded, you know, $10 million in grants to different organizations throughout the country who are helping people to prepare for citizenship. Um, and libraries really play a crucial role in serving immigrant communities, you know, obviously. Um, which is evident through the partnership. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the citizenship with uh, UCIS, um, I attended a, a workshop hosted um, by the Evanston, Evanston Public Library, and it was to inform staff, um, and this was in September of 2013. And I actually didn't have citizenship until I think summer, the summer, this past summer. Um, so the USCIS um, does a, um, outreach to organizations serving immigrant populations um, and educating not only uh, potential applicants, but also um, staff that works with them. So I contacted the community officer with the USCIS and set a date for presentation 
oh, it's February 2014, excuse me. Uh, I'm getting my dates mixed up. Um, so there was also no registration for the event because it was more lecture style. Um, so it basically went over um, the eligibility requirements, um, the process of naturalization, um, the citizenship tests, and the rights and responsibilities of U.S. citizenship. So um, I think that um, they, I think they do like a general overview workshop, and then they have another one where um, they do a mock interview. So two people from the USCIS come um, and do like a mock interview to you know help people kind of prepare for for the interview process of citizenship. Um, so I did the usual channels of advertisement, um, Facebook uh, and flyers in the library. Um, there was a lower turnout. I think we had maybe three to five people. Um, and it seems like there's not as many people um, at the citizenship stage in our community. And that's what I'm guessing. Um, it doesn't mean that I prob I'll probably will try it again. Um, the benefits of citizenship, um, obviously automatic citizenship for um, a lawful permanent resident children, once someone becomes a, a citizen, um, their children under the age of 18 also are, are citizens. You know, the ability to travel and, you know, seek protection of the U.S. government, um, protection from deportation for you and your children, you get to vote. I mean, you you're um, better able to participate in society fully. I mean, um, so uh, some of the drawbacks of the process of citizenship, I'm not, I'm not saying that becoming a citizen is uh, a bad thing. I'm just saying the possibility, <clears throat> again, is still there of deportation when going through the natu uh, naturalization process. Um, also, um, there's a possible language barrier for, for some people. Um, only people over the age of 50 with uh, 20 years um, residing in the U.S. or the age of 55 with 15 years can take the, um, um, the naturalization test in their native language. But those people also have to have very, very limited English. So that's one of the, the um, possible drawbacks for the, pro the process of becoming a citizen. Um, so uh, here are some of the resources, um, especially with the USCIS, um, that I um, want to plug because they have a, really actually a, a lot of really good resources for citizenship. Um, they have, and I have links at the end of my presentation, uh, the Citizenship Resource Center, um, and it has these three tabs, the learners, um, which has information on how to study for the test, test questions, um, finding help in your community. Um, and under the Teachers tab, it's, um, there's lesson plans and activities, um, training and professional development. Um, and then organizations, they also have, you know, program development if you're interested in providing citizenship classes and also information on their grant program. Um, the USCIS and the IMLS partnership, the Institute of Museum and Library um, Libraries, um, they create, like I, I mentioned before in the beginning of my presentation, the partnership in June, oh, 3013, it's 2013. Um, it's really to help libraries, um, you know, give accurate and useful information on, on immigration and citizenship, promote awareness and understanding of citizenship, and ensure the integrity of the immigration system. And that's taking from the IMLS New Americans website, which the link I have I have later, and also the the IMS. I am, sorry, I am LS, also has links to webinars um, to train staff on immigration-related topics. Um, so this is also a really good resource to libraries that might not um, have more direct access to the USCIS. Um, also, okay, this is um, oops. 
sorry. <laughs> um, also, the um, there was an initiative. Yeah, it was probably a couple years ago of citizenship corners in libraries. Um, so it's basically creating a designated area of the library for citizenship. Excuse me, citizenship resources, um, and. Some libraries, I think there, it was between the USCIS and um, the Los Angeles Public Libraries, um, which has, I think, 73 libraries. Um, but they created a space, a designated space for um, resource and materials. And so some of the items they included are um, test questions, information on naturalization, and the N40 form, which is used to fill out as a naturalization form. Um, and also, uh, the USCIS has print materials on citizenship that you're able to um, order through their website. Um, and also, we actually have one of these at our library. Um, order a USCIS civics and citizenship tool kit for free. So if you're an organization that um, serves uh, immigrants, uh, you get one free kit. And inside the kit has... I, I think it's a DVD, and it also has a book, and it has flashcards on um, citizenship questions. So, um, so that's also another uh, really good way to serve immigrants in your community. And um, we don't have a citizenship corner at our library because we're somewhat limited with space. But I really like that idea, um, and so. Uh, let's see where I don't have any more slides. <laughs> I thought I had more. There was more. Slides. Okay, so questions. <laughs> sure. Okay, great, Kathy. That was great. Um, uh -huh. Does any? Um, did, did you have more that you did? You said you, didn't, you want. You thought you had more slides. Did you have other th programs you wanted to talk about, or? No, no oh. more slides. As in, I think there was a delay. That I have the after this question slides. I have um, some online resource links. Okay, cool. um, mostly. I think I have three from CIS, um, and then something of uh, one for the National Legal Directory mm -hmm. um, for um, Im immigrants for each state. Um, so each state, um, I imagine, has hopefully at least one organization that works with immigrants. Right, their own local. So yeah. Refer, yeah. Okay. So does anybody have any other any questions for Kathy about any of the programs she was talking about here, or anything to share about programs that you've done similarly in um, your library? Uh, <clears throat> go ahead and type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar interface. I'll grab them here. Um, while we're waiting to see if anyone does have any questions, um, we can go to those links if you want to show them there. Uh, oh, sure, great. Um, we will okay. post these um, every time we do a show here. We'll get the slides from our presenter, so Kathy will send me her slides. When I put up the recording, you'll have access to the slides, and we'll put these links into our Delicious account at the Library Commission, so you can have a quick link to them as well. So we'll have all the resources um, that were mentioned here. You'll be able to get to them. Okay. Doesn't look like any major questions are coming in. I was just wondering. Okay. You said you have a lot of varying programs here on different different things mm -hmm. that people need to, you know, like you said, legal information that people need. Did you have? I know you said the the, the attendance varied depending on the program. Um, uh -huh. Did you have a lot of trouble convincing people? Was it was depending on the program, like convincing them that this was something they needed to do, or you know, what do you think was the reasoning why some of them came out um, seemed better, you know? Receive better reception than other ones. Um, or is that just? It's possible. <laughs> well, I, I think the the temporary driver's license was kind of a pressing issue, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. or um, the DACA one was kind of a press more pressing current issue. And mm -hmm. citizenship, um, possibly, there might not be as many people in our district that um, might not be at that point in order to apply for citizenship. Um, it's not maybe as a pressing issue, I guess. To be, it's not super important for people to become a, a citizen because of X consequence, I guess, maybe. Right. Um, so um, that's kind of what my guess is. Um, I would definitely do it again just because I, I, I don't want to assume that there aren't people that want that information. But um, they left, uh, USCIS left um, 
you know, they left free literature for us, so I, I definitely put that in um, the Spanish collection. I have um, a small area for pamphlets of local information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never know when people are going to need that info, info on, when they decide to become a citizen. It's not like a, a certain time of year or anything. And like you said, the other programs, they were recent changes to the laws and yeah. and new new yeah. re new regulations and things people had to jump on and and it was right you know right in everybody in front of everybody's mind of course yeah yep yeah. yep yeah, definitely yeah uh, so it doesn't look like anybody had any other questions right now so that's great not okay, a problem great. um oh wait something great. did just pop up sorry um okay sure. why not do you did you help people complete applications no um i think uh, for the DACA, um, our library in general, it, I would prefer people, I guess, um, refer to a lawyer because mm. it's kind of a, a touchy issue. Um, I don't want to give legal advice to anybody um, about how they should answer a question if they don't know how to answer a question. Um, so, and there is through... Um, the Illinois uh, Bar Association um, lawyers that work pro bono. Um, there's also locally, and I've I, I'd like to tap into it. And I haven't had an opportunity. Um, DePaul University in Chicago has an immigration clinic um, that it's a possibility for to refer people to. Obviously, they're not you know they're students, but um, it could be a good resource for somebody oh, yeah, also. Yeah. yeah, that's something that's common in in when it comes to legal information and you know health information that you know we, yep. we can show you where to go we can show you where to contact someone but we're really not qualified <laughs> to take yeah. that extra step and um, yeah. but if you have places that's great you have places that you can refer them to that are the right people can that know mm -hmm. and are you know mm -hmm. even potentially legally allowed to give them the yeah. assistance yeah, yeah that's great to find yeah. find those resources yeah. definitely uh-huh yeah so any other last minute questions okay. from anybody? You want to get them in there before we wrap up for the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and you can always contact me. Um, uh, my first, I think my first slide has my email address. So mm -hmm. um, if other questions come up, um, you know, definitely feel free to contact me. Yeah, if you want to try and try some of these um, programs in your own library, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, um, Kathy. That was very uh -huh. interesting. Yeah, lots of great resources Thank you. for people. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm great. Yeah. It's great. It was great to be um, just to talk about what I'm doing in my library. All right. So hold on for a bit. We'll just wrap up the show here. Um, I'm going to pull back presenter control so I can show my screen here. There we go. There it is. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending uh, Encompass Live today. The show is being recorded and will be available oh, later this afternoon, potentially. Uh, as I said, we'll have the slides Kathy will send to me, and links to all the websites that she mentioned will be um, included when we put up the recording on the Encampus Live website we have here. Um, and I will announce and let you guys all know when that's available. Uh, so that wraps up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is the best new youth books of 2014. Uh, Sally Snyder is the coordinator of Children's and Young Adult Cert Library Services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And every year she does book talks of new titles for teens, um, everything from preschool all the way up through high school, older teens. Um, she does this at our state library conference in the fall. And then we bring her on the show so that she can um, redo it again uh, for anyone who wasn't able to attend in um, the actual conference. And so this would be good for anybody who serves children, teens, young adults, uh, come and see what new titles um, are coming out for, that were new this year. Uh, so Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, you can go ahead and like us over on Facebook. We will uh, post uh, new shows that are coming up, reminders when the recordings are available. Here I posted a reminder this morning just letting people know you can log on for today's show. So if you are uh, into using Facebook, go ahead and like us there and we'll keep you up to date on what we are doing on the show. Other than that, thank you very much for attending. We are wrapped up for today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.